Star Wars is responsible for so many trends in filmmaking that we still live with 45 years later. The summer blockbuster, the special effects extravaganza, the rise of computer-generated effects and digital post-production, the mega-merchandising of franchise films, and even the reinvention of production workflows with virtual environments rather than conventional locations. And there's one more thing Star Wars was almost solely responsible for inspiring. The fan edit. A few years ago, I remember being baffled by Warner Brothers' plans to make three films based on The Hobbit, after they'd done such a stellar job adapting each volume of the Lord of the Rings trilogy into three solid fantasy adventure films. Each one of those books was at least twice the length of The Hobbit, but they each received one film padding The Hobbit out to three films of equal duration as the Lord of the Rings installments sounded like money-grabbing idiocy. And it was. Sort of stretched, like butter scraped over too much bread. Enter Maple Films and a Tolkien fan who decided to roll up the proverbial sleeves and cut the entire extended trilogy of The Hobbit down to a single film that conformed to the actual book as closely as possible. The result is a very watchable introduction to the first adventure involving the One Ring, and we couldn't be more grateful for this effort. Maple Films' cut of The Hobbit does not stand alone, but is in terms of numbers merely a noteworthy entry in what is now a legacy of innumerable fan edits to major motion pictures. At times, these fan edits have been given almost official recognition by the home studios. Most notably, Waterworld was edited by a fan into what was known as the Ulysses Cut, which took the 40 extra minutes from the TV broadcast and combined it with the theatrical cut elements to create an extended cut of the film. Arrow Video, for their Blu-ray release, officially reconstructed this fan edit with high-definition elements as an optional cut for viewers to enjoy. You know, he's like a turd that won't flush. And the genesis of the fan edit? The Star Wars Special Editions. People unhappy with the changes to the three films wanted the option of watching the original versions. Some editors used the best commercially available options to set about restoring the original cuts through digital editing tools as with the Harmy Despecialized editions, while others, like Adiwan's Revisited Project, wanted to embrace the special edition effects upgrades while removing the tonally inconsistent material introduced into the special edition. <laughs> Quickly followed by that were fan attempts to make Star Wars The Phantom Menace a better film through works like The Phantom Edit, which sought to downplay characters like Jar Jar Binks and some of Anakin's cheesier line deliveries. To date, there are probably more fan edits of the three Star Wars prequels than any other film series. Very rarely do I watch fan edits, not because of any sense of elitism, but more because in the majority of cases, nobody can agree on which fan edit of a film does the best job of improving the broken film in question. Given how difficult fan edits can be to gain access to, when there's no consensus of opinion, I tend to go find something else to do. You want to go home and rethink your life? I want to go home and rethink my life. How However, occasionally, as with the Maple Films Hobbit and the Ulysses cut of Waterworld, intrigue wins out over pragmatism. Such was the case with the Patterson cut of the new Obi-Wan Kenobi miniseries on Disney+. As much as I, like many others, enjoyed Ewan McGregor as Kenobi in the prequel trilogy, I've become so disenchanted with Disney's handling of the franchise, I find myself unable to get my hopes up about any of it these days. <laughs> Please do not resist. Disney Star Wars is like that alcoholic friend that promises he's really and truly given up the sauce this time, so give him one more chance. So you do, and he bursts in through the door, hammered as usual. But McGregor was enough of a pull that I decided to watch Obi-Wan Kenobi thanks to help from a friend with a Disney Plus account. The word I would use to describe the resulting story I watched is... baffling. What's this? Obi-Wan is pressed back into service to rescue a young Leia, who was kidnapped on the orders of the Imperial Inquisitors in order to bait Kenobi to reveal himself so they can eliminate him. In the process, it is revealed that one of the Inquisitors was a surviving Jedi youngling from Anakin's Massacre who has since joined Vader's cadre of sadists in some unclear attempt to get revenge on him for murdering Jedi by murdering Jedi herself, apparently. This is thin, Riggs. This is very thin. Is that right, sir? Obi-Wan learns Darth Vader is his former friend Anakin Skywalker. They fight again twice. Obi-Wan wins... 
again. Obi-Wan doesn't kill Anakin again. Always with you, it cannot be done. I can't kill my own father. Then the Emperor has already won. You are not only a murderer, you are a hypocrite. Obi-Wan returns Leia to Alderaan and the vengeful Inquisitor Reva, after surviving a lightsaber through the stomach somehow, figures out that the boy of Owen and Beru Lars is the son of Darth Vader and attempts to kill Luke in a raid on the farm at night. Conveniently, she does not kill Owen or Beru in this attack and ultimately does not murder an unconscious Luke Skywalker, surrendering him to Kenobi. And despite having hunted down and murdered scores of Jedi at Vader's behest, not to mention likely countless numbers of innocent people, Kenobi tells Reva that she totally redeemed herself by not killing Luke and she's free to go do whatever. I thought I was having a stroke. <laughs> It's no surprise the series is badly written. It's Disney Lucasfilm. But what stymied me more than the predictably bad writing was how the story they chose highlights 40 years of compounding problems with the Star Wars franchise that go back far beyond Disney's acquisition of the property. You can pick a good premise for a story and destroy it with bad execution. You can pick a weak premise and save it with clever writing. However, in the case of Obi-Wan Kenobi, they concocted an unworkable premise and curb stomped it with terrible scripting. And I wasn't the only person who felt this way. A fan with more optimism than I'm willing to muster decided to pull a Maple Film spin kick to Obi-Wan Kenobi by cutting out approximately four hours of the thing and turning it into a two hour and change feature film instead that hoped to correct many of the story and character problems in the miniseries series, as well as remove the excess bloat within the content. I can do that. I can do that. As with The Hobbit, I had enough morbid curiosity with Obi-Wan Kenobi to see if it could succeed, so I secured a copy of the Patterson cut and watched the story again, albeit with four hours extra left in my day to do something else when it was over. The result of the Patterson cut is definitely an improved viewing experience in terms of pacing and character interaction, with a few opportunities taken to preserve the continuity where the six-part miniseries was happy to break canon entirely. The major example of this is the complete removal of Inquisitor Reva's discovery of Luke Skywalker and attempt on the boy's life. While she's still revealed to have been a Jedi youngling survivor, she is seen in this edit as beyond redemption and, as this cut implies, dies from Vader's skewering. Meanwhile, certain aspects of the original version of the miniseries are still here for reasons only the editor can explain, such as the Imperial Lab where all of the dead Jedi are entombed in amber liquid, including a youngling whose corpse is still wearing that silly training hat for no explicable reason. In other cases, the stupid has to stay for scene continuity, specifically the now infamous Laser Gate, where Obi-Wan and Leia simply could have walked around it rather than blasting it open. Because the Patterson cut is such a leaner, economized version of the story, it made the transcendent problems with the Star Wars franchise as a whole far more visible on the surface. First, I want to address a problem that the Patterson cut inadvertently manages to improve by degrees, but one which remains an issue not just with Obi-Wan Kenobi, but many of the various Star Wars projects since Disney's acquisition. Prequel predictability. One of the most frequent comments I heard about the prequel trilogy at the time was how everyone already knew how it's going to end. We knew Obi-Wan, Yoda, Anakin, and the Emperor weren't going to die. And aside from various continuity-cracking decisions made by Lucas with the Force, the character of Qui-Gon Jinn, and the birth of the Skywalker twins, the story could only go one way. You're living in the past, man! Similarly, the Clone Wars television series, despite all of its new inclusions, also only had one destination in sight, the events of Revenge of the Sith. I'm so sorry. So Disney's projects, such as Rogue One and Solo, suffer the same problems. While Rogue One suffers these issues less than Solo, because we don't know the characters, so their fates aren't certain, with Solo, most of the main characters will end up in the original trilogy, so the tension is less than zero. And with Rogue One, we know the Rebels end up with the plans to the Death Star, so it really just becomes a two-hour guessing game of who, if anyone, will survive the doing. What we are doing for this section is entirely futile. <laughs> <laughs> we will talk for a bit, then we will guess, then we'll and guess. then it will be over. <laughs>
The lesson the writers of Obi-Wan Kenobi didn't learn here is if you're going to write a prequel and center it on a character that will be alive in subsequent already produced and well-known works, you'd better put that character in a situation totally apart from the established storyline so they can encounter a completely new cast of characters for the audience to get invested in and then feel concerned for as the stakes of the adventure begin to climb. But that's not what the writers did at all. They put Obi-Wan in a story that involved Darth Vader, Princess Leia, and Luke Skywalker, as well as Owen and Beru Lars. So your entire cast of protagonists is devoid of any stakes whatsoever. They could have had Obi-Wan sent on a mission to a different world to aid a group of outnumbered innocent people. I didn't actually come here to free slaves. Ah or have Yoda send him on a search, so at least we don't know if he'll find what he's looking for by the end. They are using a bounty hunter named Jango Fett to create a clone army. Heck, they could have even had him rescue a character we've never heard of before. But no, the writers planted their flags within very on-rails events and used locked-down characters. A supremely poor choice by any measure. That's why the Han Solo adventure novels in the late 1970s work better than the Solo film by Disney, because the adventures were not tied to situations shoehorning in characters like Darth Maul. Rather, they were tales of Han Solo's in-universe encounters with other good guys and bad guys while on smuggling jobs. Han Solo and Chewbacca were our anchors into seeing how the rest of the galaxy operated. The tension and uncertainty came from the events around them, and those new characters whose fates were up for grabs. By comparison, in Obi-Wan Kenobi, the only major character whose destiny is unknown to the viewer is the Inquisitor Reva. So the only major character introduced by the writers whose fate isn't already known to the audience is one of the evil villains. It's as if the writers thought they could punch way above their weight by creating the most difficult scenario possible to work within and thought they could succeed. And you blow it! Generally speaking, sadistic villains who are killing innocent people are not characters whose fates the audience is overly concerned with, beyond hoping they die horribly at the end. Every single major hero in this movie, as well as the biggest villain, are protected from any risk by the plot armor of the original trilogy. So instead, the writers opted to attempt to make a villain, a type of character audiences are trained to dislike, the sole character with all the agency? I immediately regret this decision. And was that agency trying to become the next person to sit at the Emperor's right hand? No, because if that was the case, I could have believed her actions as they related to her motivation. Alas, it wasn't that rational. No, in this case, we got to watch her murder innocent people and fugitive Jedi before being told she wanted revenge against Vader for the murder of the Jedi. What? Now that we've discussed Reva, we've got to acknowledge what a terrible idea Inquisitors are to begin with. A creation of Disney Lucasfilm with the launch of Star Wars Rebels, Inquisitors are anachronisms within the saga. Helicopter lightsabers are bad enough, but worse is the fundamental story point firmly established by the prequels these characters break. Always do there are no more. No less. Anyone out there right now saying shows like The Clone Wars changed the rules with Ventress and Savage Opress, Sa Savage Opress, whatever, or that the Emperor started pulling in more potential cronies after Order 66, those are impressive mental gymnastics, but hardly credible rationales. Creators are just as fallible as the rest of us, and like parents, they can make bad decisions when raising their children. I have failed you, Anakin. I have failed you. Disney compounded these bad decisions with the creation of additional Dark Force users in the Inquisitors, as well as all of the rogue Jedi running around the galaxy, from Kanan and Ezra to Cal Kestis and Siri Junda. Why did you let us do that? It's so bad! Why is this such a bad thing, you ask? There can be other Jedi and Sith running around in a pre-original trilogy world, right? Wrong. Doing so breaks one of the basic understandings of the time of the Galactic Civil War in the original trilogy. And yes, I said breaks. This isn't something up for negotiation if the story is supposed to work credibly. I've heard people try to argue since Obi-Wan Kenobi takes place before the original film, there is no evidence to suggest there wouldn't be additional known Force users in existence. Um... The Jedi are extinct. Their fire has gone out of the universe. You, my friend, are all that's left of their religion. That's pretty much from the horse's mouth right there. And it's an open-shut kind of statement. You, my friend, are all that's left of their religion. 
You might try the argument that Tarkin was referring to Jedi and not Sith, so therefore what Disney has done with the Inquisitors is just fine. But if the Empire had been employing force-wielding Inquisitors with lightsabers while openly hunting late-stage Jedi fugitives all the way up until just a few years prior to the 1977 Star Wars film, wouldn't you think Luke would have heard about the Force and the powerful people who can wield it for the Imperial government? Especially since Anchorhead, according to the Obi-Wan Kenobi series, was the location of some major Inquisitor activity. And let's not forget the other big plot hole created here. Even if you say Luke had been sheltered like the kid of a pair of cultists living in a commune, and hence wouldn't know about the Force, you think he wouldn't remember his home being attacked one evening by a powerful lightsaber-wielding maniac out to murder him? Go! <laughs> You're gonna tell me that never once came up in a conversation with his aunt and uncle ever again. Never? What Many sort levels. of mind games are you playing? <laughs> See, in instances like this, plausible being on such a razor's edge doesn't mean it's wise writing. You might as well ask the audience to believe Obi-Wan can suddenly turn into a snowman at will, because the narrow amount of plausibility to explain that away is about the same amount accorded the attack on Luke by Reva at the end of this series. We're asked to believe, despite the gravity of the stakes in protecting Luke and keeping watch over him being so important that Obi-Wan initially refuses to help Bail Organa rescue Leia, that Obi-Wan never deleted old emails nor spoke in any code to throw off the Imperials that might be listening in on his calls. Ooh, that's bad. We're asked to believe that Luke will never bring this attempt on his life up with his aunt and uncle and lollygag through his childhood ignorant of the Force, lightsabers, and Jedi. Die. That's bad. We're asked to believe that Obi-Wan, despite his sole purpose now being to watch over the boy and train him in the ways of the Force, allows his powers to wane to such a critical low that he can't even defend himself from those that would seek to harm Luke. I'm not who I used to be. Oh, that's terrible. We're asked to believe that a revenge-crazed Inquisitor who has murdered countless people in this story wouldn't murder the aunt and uncle in her way because plot armor. That's terrible! And we're asked to believe that Kenobi, whose sole purpose now is, let me repeat, to protect Luke and eventually train him to confront his father and save the galaxy, would not eliminate one of Vader's Inquisitors upon discovering she has learned the identity of Luke Skywalker. That's bad. This is the same version of Kenobi that also had Anakin dead to rights for a second time and could have himself saved the universe from Vader, but then didn't again because Anakin was given another massive dose of plot armor. You, you say you want to help me, and then, and, then, and then you do this! And I keep asking myself why he didn't kill Vader. A huge threat to the future of the galaxy, a mass murderer, and the Emperor's most powerful weapon. I keep asking myself what Obi-Wan even means when he says, I will do what I must. Okay, if we only go by the Mustafar duel, I will do what I must. He left Anakin to burn to death in a dismembered heap. Cruel, yes, but I can be sold on the idea that he didn't think Anakin could survive such injuries. But now we get a repeat of, I will do what I must. Delightful news for someone who cares. <laughs> And the results end up being the same. You will do what you must to what, Ben? Save your own skin but let Vader live to torment the people of the galaxy another day? What do the writers at Disney think it means when Kenobi says, I will do what I must? Because they've made it a rhetorical statement, an empty line. I will do what I must, which is next to nothing. Because after I trounce you for a second time, I won't take you to a space prison and I won't kill you, even though you're the biggest threat to everything, including my own life. I'm walking away, but remember, I did what I must. <coughs> you might argue, well, if Kenobi had killed Vader, then the Emperor would have gotten someone to replace him who might have been more capable and dangerous. Ooh. If a single one of those Inquisitors Disney has introduced were more powerful and capable than Vader, you don't think the Emperor would have known that and already eliminated the walking respirator? He would have, and you know it. And that's why Disney doesn't want you to think about this too much because they know they've written the saga into an illogical cul-de-sac. Writers who don't know how to keep things fresh with legacy properties often fall into a trap of adding things rather than taking things away to invent story challenges. We see this a lot in comic books where they add a new superpower or ability or costume in a weak attempt to jazz up the story. Instead of finding new quandaries for the characters to surmount through story-driven limitations, such as Obi-Wan losing his lightsaber 
for an entire story. Or becoming separated from his allies, average writers will add things to the universe to reset the chessboard the way they want it. They're asked to write in a time when the Jedi are supposed to be extinct, but they don't want to work with that status quo. So they invent the Inquisitors and Kanan and Jara so they can have their cake and eat it too. Unconcerned that they just broke the established state of the galaxy at the time in previous works of accepted canon, in this case, the original trilogy. At this point, some of you might be saying, Michael, you're talking about creating limitations, and they did when they made Obi-Wan weak. All things in a story have to make sense, whether they add or subtract. You can't establish at the beginning of this series a stark reminder that Obi-Wan is supposed to be protecting Luke Skywalker beyond all else, but then reveal he can't even help himself anymore in the one area in which he's supposed to train Luke. That subtraction was just as big a miscalculation by the writers as the addition of Obi-Wan's new boulder-throwing superpower. If Obi-Wan can do that in a state of weakened force ability, where was this power for both Anakin and Obi-Wan while fighting on Mustafar? Why weren't the flaming lava rocks flying in from all directions as weapons for the two Jedi? See how an addition has to make as much sense as a subtraction? And obviously, taking things away to create limits can go too far in the other direction and cause its own problems. In the expanded universe novels of the 1990s, most of the authors hobbled Luke Skywalker within the first few chapters because they didn't know how to write for a character with so many abilities. Quite often, Luke would become this sickened emo character until the final chapter, when he He'd snap out of it and save everyone else. In watching the Patterson cut, I observed how the editor was able to eliminate some of these writing mistakes, specifically seeing the need to keep Inquisitor Reva a vicious villain who dies at Vader's hand, though the fan edit does retain her Jedi youngling origins, which remains as confusing as before. However, as a greater mercy, there was no longer an attempt on Luke's life. And now comes the part that the Patterson cut brought so sharply into focus, it became the entire reason I felt compelled to make this video. So far, we've noted the missteps of the Disney-era writers of Star Wars in various productions. We've even acknowledged the prequels and animated series under George Lucas that muddied the waters of the saga. But what the Patterson cut showed me was how one of the first and biggest mistakes has crippled Disney's every effort on the franchise. There I was watching the more moderate and truncated version of Obi-Wan Kenobi, and upon this viewing, I realized how much the young Leia plot could have worked if George Lucas hadn't made a fatal last-minute change to the plan during Return of the Jedi. As we all know, Lucas was going through a rough time in his life and wanted to take a long break from Star Wars, so rather than make people wait, he decided to make Leia the sister of Luke Skywalker to wrap everything up. Most people then immediately jump to how that broke this moment, in The Empire Strikes Back. But it broke far more than that. Suddenly, Ben Kenobi is a liar not only to Luke Skywalker over the identity of his father, a running change in the development of The Empire Strikes Back, and a change largely accepted by the fan base as a good move, but now Kenobi is also a liar to Luke about his sibling, as well as looking like a forgetful dunderhead to Yoda about the girl. That boy is our last hope. No. There is another. Why would he think Luke is the last hope and have to be told by Yoda that there is another if he knows Luke has a sibling? He's an idiot. Comes from upbringing. Parents are probably idiots too. She's as important as he is. This breaks some of the most important parts of the story. It really does. Fans at the time tried to find ways to rationalize Kenobi's forgetfulness, such as, well, he didn't know who exactly it was, and Yoda told him Leia's identity after Luke left for Cloud City. But then in 2005, it got more complicated, because Obi-Wan literally helped birth the two infants, and was present when Bail Organa arranged to take Leia to Alderaan. Ah. Therefore, having the writers choose to send Kenobi on a swashbuckling space adventure with young Princess Leia is, frankly, irresponsible screenwriting. You are reckless. I can hear you now. The damage was already done back in 1982 by Lucas himself, so what difference does it make now? While we can acknowledge George Lucas himself broke the Leia Ben Kenobi thing by making Leia the sister of Luke and making Kenobi aware of her existence via the end of Revenge of the Sith, that doesn't absolve the present-day writers of the responsibility to take care not to break that story point further. If you discover a chair in your house has a broken leg, and you repair it, you don't then start setting refrigerators in that chair like some kind of test. You preserve the repair by keeping as much weight off of it as you can and making it a standard light-duty chair, the one you tell people not to use as a step stool. 
Similarly, these writers should have kept as much weight off Lucas's mistake with Leia and Kenobi as possible. They completely didn't. Instead, they threw an anvil at it and called full attention to it when they should have been encouraging the franchise to look in other directions. And for which they must be punished! <laughs> I honestly got the sense that the writers on this project wrote this story with only the lines and scenes from the original 1977 film in mind. Sadly, that is not crafting a story with a canonical mindset, as every writer on a franchise this big needs to be tasked with doing. Instead of looking at what occurred in the broader canvas of events to inform their script and characters, these writers wanted to hang entire character interactions on various lines and even subjective interpretations of lines from the 1977 film alone. Then Kenobi, where is he? Come on! Now, I said a second ago that the young Leia Kenobi adventure plot could have worked if Lucas hadn't changed the plan in 1982. Not only would it have worked, it would have been a really fun thing to do, lending weight to Leia's obvious reverence for Ben Kenobi in the 1977 film. However, because of what happened in Return of the Jedi, which recontextualized the line from Empire into a continuity gaffe, That boy is our last hope. No. There is another. This young Leia plot in Obi-Wan Kenobi is a huge misfire that only draws further attention to a badly damaged corner of Star Wars lore. A life of excellence is a boring life. <laughs> um, I think we also need just comforting mediocrity. The writers of this series thought they were shining new light into unseen corners of Star Wars canon, but what they were actually doing was picking at an ugly scab, and thanks to them, the wound is now infected. Just consider that moment where Obi-Wan looks at Leia when she asks him if he's her father, and his response is, I wish I were. This loaded line can imply that he had a romantic attraction to Padme. And in point of fact, in the original drafts for The Phantom Menace, Obi-Wan is the only Jedi in the first half of the film, with Qui-Gon Jinn not showing up until he arrives on Coruscant. It's therefore Obi-Wan, not Qui-Gon, who travels to Mos Espa with Padme in tow. And it is heavily described in the script that Padme is becoming attracted to this mysterious Jedi, setting up an Othello-Iago-type plot later on in the trilogy with Anakin. However, because that plot point was thrown out long ago in the development of Phantom Menace and never became canon, using that loaded line in the Obi-Wan Kenobi miniseries I wish I could say I was. is like dropping a lead weight right on the foot of the continuity. Because there's no context for it, and no context illustrated in hindsight, that line makes no sense. Wait a minute, how did this happen? We're smarter than this. Turning Leia into Luke's sister wasn't the first change made to the story plan, but it was the first major mistake. Even in 1983, we winced at the unbelievable convenience of that plot twist. Ever since, that ill-conceived adjustment to the story has shadowed the saga. J.J. Abrams couldn't conceive of Leia as a Jedi, because we all know for two films, she literally wasn't written as a Jedi. So he fudged in some dialogue about her having given up her training. Make no mistake, she wasn't the one using the Force at the end of Empire. Luke was using the Force to reach out to her. He called out her name. It was a one-way phone call, for one intended recipient. And if your argument is Leia is Force-sensitive because only a Force-sensitive person could hear Luke's plea, that would imply a Force user can only send calls to another Force user. So why would Luke have assumed Leia could take the call at all? Then Ryan Johnson really didn't know how to handle Luke as Leia's sister. And there's no point going into Rise of Skywalker's handling of the character. While I maintain the sequel trilogy would have been better served without including the classic heroes, if they had to be included, Leia not being Luke's sister would have saved us from moments like this. The Patterson cut of Obi-Wan Kenobi gave me the briefest of glimpses of what a Star Wars saga without that first mistake might have been like, barring the pointless and equally lore-damaging duels with Vader, which this fan edit did not attempt to excise because it really couldn't get around them. If the first season of Mandalorian proved anything, it's that Star Wars is only going to succeed and survive if it steps completely away from anything to do with the Skywalkers, the Sith, and the characters intertwined with those events. But we all know Disney cannot do that. 
Since The Force Awakens, their strategy has been to create weekly written new characters that surf on the backs of original characters and use their names and presence as the marketing hook. But it's a bait and switch every time. The sequel trilogy traded on the names of Luke, Han, and Leia. The Book of Boba Fett exploited Boba Fett as a marketing ploy, and now Obi-Wan Kenobi isn't really Obi-Wan's story either. This is Disney's cheap attempt to promote Reva because they weren't confident enough in this creation to have her stand on her own out of the gate. There is no concern in Disney's strategy for preserving logical story continuity. When they want legitimacy for their half-baked ideas, they'll throw in Luke, or Luke, or Luke, or Obi-Wan, or Obi-Wan and Luke. I'm with you too. So these new characters are seen interacting with and touching the events the audience already respects, because these new characters cannot survive in projects of their own. This punches irreparable holes in the legacy timeline when Lucasfilm could be creating new scenarios with new characters in other parts of this franchise. Disney is using the original characters and storylines as campfire kindling to prop up mediocre ideas. That's why I'm here. Despite the Herculean effort, the Patterson cut cannot take Obi-Wan Kenobi from a useless experience to a useful one. Given the way the Star Wars saga has already played out across the past 45 years, Obi-Wan Kenobi is a pointless exercise in prioritizing emotions over competence, in corporate pandering over genuine understanding of the property, and the canary in the coal mine for a franchise that needs a serious, merciless, bold shakedown if it is to recapture its former glory. 